morning, good afternoon, and a very warm welcome to our webinar today on the age of algorithms ensuring explainable fairness. Today we are joined by our distinguished speaker, Dr. Cathy O'Neill, mathematician, data analyst and author. My name is Joyce O'Connor and I chaired the IIEA Digital Policy Group here um, and I'll be the moderator of today's event. It's my great pleasure to welcome you, Cathy, to our meeting today. Um, I'm delighted that you're joining us from Boston, um, Harvard Square, is that true? Um, thank you very much for being with us and for taking the time out of your very busy schedule. Cathy will speak to us for about 20 to 25 minutes, and I'll go to you then, our audience, for Q&A. Please join our discussion using the Q&A function at the bottom of our screen. I look forward to receiving your questions. Today's presentation and the Q&A as ever are on the record. And join us in our discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. I think first before we get to Cathy, I think it might be useful to set the context in which we're looking at AI AI regulations in, in Europe and uh, Ireland and other member states. The EU's and the European Commission approach to digital innovation and technological pro uh, progress, especially in the regulatory area, has been very much one looking at regulation. The digital agenda together with the green agenda has been the key priorities since Ursula von der Leyen became European Commission president almost three years ago. And as we have seen over the last while, the EU has adopted a raft of regulation and it intends to lead in the creation of global regulatory norms for the digital economy. While the Digital Markets Act, the Digital Service Act, Data Governance and the CHIPS Act have worked through the legislative process, the Artificial Intelligence Act, together with the Data Act, are still in the legislative process. And I think it's fair to say there's been an extensive consultative process as well with all stakeholders. The EU Commission believes that the proposed Artificial Intelligence Act should become the global standard if it is to be fully effective. The questions arise, will the AI Act boost the uptake of AI and guarantee a human-centric approach? The proposed AI Act uses a risk-based approach to classify AI systems with different requirements and obligations according to the intended purpose and level of risk. Cathy O'Neill today offers another perspective. Cathy will discuss how algorithms and big data pose risk to equality and social fairness and can promote discrimination. Cathy will explain how the concept of explainable fairness should be used to prevent and mitigate social harms caused by algorithms. She will propose that regulations should be translated into coding of algorithms instead of expecting lawyers and regulators to decipher mathematical formulas. Cathy, over to you. We look forward to your presentation. I should say, just if I may, Cathy, just give a little bit on your background, uh, which I, I, I'd like to, our, our audience to know in more detail. Uh, Cathy gradu graduated from uh, Harvard with the PhD in maths, lectured in MIT, was a math professor at Barnard College and left academia to work in a hedge fund, D.E. Shaw, and as a data scientist in the New York ecosystem. She's CEO of Orca, an algorithmic, uh, uh, algorithmic auditing company, and a member of the Public Interest Tech Lab at the Harvard Kennedy School. Her book, Weapons of Mass Map Destruction, How Data Measures Inequality and Threatens Democracy is a bestseller, New York Times bestseller, and was listed for the National Book Award for Nonfiction. She operates a blog, mapbabe.org, and is a contributor to Bloomberg View. Kathy, over to you. Oh, thank you so much, Joyce. I really appreciate it. Um, I have to acknowledge um, that I admit actually a confession that I 
Uh, I didn't realize I only have 20 minutes. So I'm going to be skipping oh, no, around. 20, no, you can go on a little longer. 25 minutes oh. would be fine, Kathy. Okay. 30, yeah, sorry, no, yeah. No, that's okay. Um, I'll I'll still skip some things, but that's okay. I want to get to the main, uh, main issue, which is the explainable fairness uh, framework. So um, I... I wrote this book, Weapons of Math Destruction, and I'm I'm going to present a little bit about it just because I think it's really good background. Um, I performed triage on the world of algorithms, um, which I was writing in 2014 or so. We're already incredibly pervasive in most, I would say, previously bureaucratic systems in the United States. So like when you try to get a job, when you try to um, get health care, when you try to get a mortgage, um, or insurance, um, those were all being determined by algorithm, even stuff about how long do you go to prison if you're convicted for a crime. Um, these were really important and widespread algorithms that were secret scoring systems that people didn't understand and couldn't complain about. They were also destructive, that, which isn't just to say that they were sometimes wrong because all, of, all systems are sometimes wrong, but they, they were sort of systematically wrong um, for specific types of people. Um, so I just want to back up and mention what I mean by an algorithm. And I'd like to give this example of um, cooking dinner for my family. The point being, well, so first the definition, it's predicting the future based on patterns in the past. So predicting future success based on patterns in the past and whether something was successful or, or a failure. Um, so for uh, for cooking a dinner, it's like I decide whether a dinner was successful. I update my algorithm for cooking dinners. Um, and of course, I try to optimize success over time. Um, the reason I'm showing a picture of my son with Nutella on his face is because his definition of success is very different from mine. Because for me, it's, it's success if my kids eat vegetables. For him, it would be success if he got to have as much Nutella as he wants. So um, one of the critical points there is that the definition of success um, determines the the, the algorithm, essentially. Of course, the data does too. Those are the two ingredients, the definition of success and the data. Um, I think people underestimate the power of that definition of success though. Um, and in particular, I just wanna point out that um, the people who control and deploy the algorithm uh, sort of are in the power. So they define success. Um, the people who are subject to the algorithm and the system that the algorithm is being used in are the ones that typically don't have the same definition of success, but don't have um, the power or sometimes even the expertise to complain about that. Um, so a couple examples from my book or uh, from, from the time since my book came out in 2016. This is from my book. This is uh, Sarah Wasaki. She was a teacher fired based on an algorithm that no one could explain to her. She had reason to believe was, uh, was gamed. Um, and false. And when she tried to appeal, she was told it's an algorithm. So we know it's fair, which is, of course is, um, which is not true. Um, there's another example that is more recent coming from the world of medical systems. So this was a healthcare health insurance company that wanted to improve um, costs for people with lots of lots of different medical problems. Like imagine that you have diabetes and heart disease and you broke your leg. Um, the problem with such patients is that they are often given um, treatment that is in conflict with their different problems. So, and that's bad for this patient, but it's also bad for the insurance company because it's expensive. Um, it's expensive to fix in particular. So they wanted to improve that inefficiency by offering help to people who had complexity, but they optimized their algorithm instead of complex to complexity, they chose a different definition of success, going back to um, my emphasis on that. Um, and their definition of success or was, or risk anyway, in this case was cost. So basically when they're looking for patterns in the past of somebody who's expensive, um, they were, you know, so they were like, people like you were expensive in the past, so we predict you'll be expensive, and therefore we're going to offer you help to navigate the system. The problem with that, of course, is that not everyone who had complex medical problems was expensive. Um, it's a correlation, of course, but not complete. Um, in particular, people that were undertreated systematically, which includes Black patients, um, weren't expensive, even though they did have complex medical needs. So Optum's algorithm ended up systematically missing 
uh, people that needed help that were black patients. And then in, in particular, the people who figured this problem out, um, who were also data scientists and doctors, suggested a different proxy, a different definition of success um, that it sort of increased the number of black patients being offered this help by a factor of two. Um, so that's a great example of how if we're if we're if we miss measure or we miss target uh, the outcome, we're predicting the wrong thing essentially, or asking the wrong question, if you will. Um, then we we tend to have algorithms that are, have real problems. There's another example I wanted to get to, um, which is the facial recognition problem. Um, the Joy Bulamwini and her colleagues looked into. Um, how accurate facial recognition really was for either Amazon or IBM or Microsoft's facial recognition softwares and found that they were much more accurate for like paler and maler faces. They call it the pale male uh, training set. That, that was the essentially the underlying problem is that the algorithms were trained on picture databases that were predominantly white and male. Um, so that was a problem. That's sort of a problem in the sense of its inconsistency, um, but it does, yeah. So um, I guess I'm gonna have to skip the part of this talk where I talk about how to audit for these kinds of problems. But I will just mention that just because IBM and probably Microsoft and probably Amazon even um, have improved their accuracy on black women, that doesn't actually mean the algorithm is fair. Um, and the, the basic reason is, um, once you have an algorithm and you're licensing it to third parties, including police departments, um, you, you are no longer in control of how it's being used. So in particular, if it's being used as a profiling tool only on you know, young, young black men, then it doesn't matter that it's accurate for white women um, because it's being used unfairly. Um, so I just, I'm, I'm just making the point that algorithms yeah. are, yeah, just aren't. Feel free to continue on, you know, don't cut your talk short. I think we'd really love what oh. you prepared. Okay, well, I'll come back to that then. Okay. Um, the open questions in, in my field of algorithmic auditing, and in, indeed, in, I think the, the world of algorithms at large, is that we don't really know, you know, Often we don't exactly know what the context will be for a given algorithm, so we don't know, um, you know, what the outcomes mean per se. So we have this sort of business model where some people build the algorithms, other people use them, and however they want. That's that's a that's what I mentioned just now with facial recognition. Um, even if we had the context fixed, uh, we don't even know what it means to define fair. I've been using the word fair um, or unjust. Um, you know, what does it mean to be fair? How do how do we determine we've gotten something, we've got the, even the right metric um, of to, to measure racial fairness? Um, and then even if we had the correct measure of the correct context sort of nailed down, the definition of, of racial equity nailed down, what is it, uh, how fair, you know, what is the threshold of fairness that we're willing to, or unfairness, if you will, that we're willing to accept? And those are all important, very, very important completely open questions um, that have not been decided pretty much in any context. Um, there might be like maybe one exception. So, but at the same time, given that our, our bureaucracies are very quickly, you know, giving way to algorithms that automate these decisions of whether somebody is worthy of something, we actually have to answer this question, right? We have to answer these questions for almost all, you know, for basically all of those high stakes situations. The questions, the way we answer the questions might be different in the, in the States and in Europe. And so that's one of the things I wanna talk about at the end, but I'll, I'll, I'll continue by mentioning that um, in my auditing company, we really have three different types of auditing. We have what I call adversarial auditing, which is essentially when like a state attorney general asks us to, um, to help them investigate a specific company for harm against consumers typically. Um, so you should, you should think of payday loans. Um, so exorbitant interest rates or exorbitant fees of loans, or, uh, you know, it could be subprime auto loans or student loans, that kind of thing. 
Um, and there, there's, again, there's like specific companies and typically the agency that hires us has subpoena power to make them give us their data so we can infer how they treat customers based on that, that data. So that's, we kind of like reverse engineer their business model based on the data that they provide, which they don't want to provide, but it's uh, required. And then there's a second type of audit where it's, I call it invitational audit. And that's when a company will say, um, hey, Orca, please come in and, and look into our algorithm. We're a little bit concerned that it's either unethical or possibly illegal. And we want you to determine whether, um, whether you agree or how to fix it. And here it's like, we don't have as many invitational audits as we would like um, in large part because uh, going back to my previous slide, like we just actually don't know the answer to these questions of like, how, what do we mean by fairness? Uh, what are the thresholds? And in particular regulators don't have a, a clear knowledge of that, which means that the companies, even the regulated companies don't really feel very much pressure to check that their algorithms are, um, are reasonable because they don't know the definition of reasonable. So, but in, even so we've learned a lot from the invitational audits that we have been invited to do. And then finally, there's um, this sort of the third party audits, we call them, um, where we, uh, or regulatory audits, where I, the idea is that we're the middlemen between regulators and companies. So if it's, uh, and right now we're working in the world of insurance. So we work for some insurance right, um, commissioners and the idea is that we uh, that the the all the insurance companies have to submit data to the to the regulators to the insurance commissioner commissioner's office, and we are the ones who analyze it and make sure that um, the their business practices are lawful, in particular that they, you know, that they comply with anti discrimination law. So I'm going to talk about invitational audits a little bit, and then I, I will I'll probably spend more time on this third party audits for which we have at Orca, we have a framework called explainable fairness. So I will do this quickly, but the, um, the, the invitational audit is pretty, is pretty um, comprehensive. We basically keep asking the same question over and over again, like for whom does this work? For whom does this fail? It gives way immediately to the notion of who are the stakeholders who, who actually care one way or the other about this algorithm. Who does this impact? Um, and we just keep asking this question. We build a matrix, which I'll mention in the next slide. But the critical thing is that this is non-technical. Um, basically, when you ask, and this goes back to the very definition of, of an algorithm with my child, you know, like he doesn't get much of a say in how the algorithm cooking, the dinner algorithm um, gets made because I'm, I'm his mom and I'm in charge. Um, that's pretty clear power dynamics and it's reasonable, but in other situations, it's not always clear <laughs> why it's reasonable that the people in power um, get to decide that, that, you know, how everything works. And so there's, I, I feel, strongly feel that there's a sort of embedded kind of power play going on where people are excluded from the conversation about how an algorithm should work and and they're basically told like you're not an expert on algorithm so you don't have an you don't get an opinion you don't get to have an opinion um the great thing about the ethical matrix approach is that it is non-technical like literally people are just like yeah this is not this is not about machine learning techniques this is about what you think is fair and actually everybody considers themselves an expert on fairness so the ethical matrix framework allows that conversation to happen outside of the world of data science. And then the idea is it's kind of, you can think, can think of it as a ethical review board type of conversation. The idea would be that the sort of embedded ethical conundrums and vault trolley problems are addressed by this stakeholder group um, representatives in a round table discussion. And then the values are surfaced and that's when the data scientists come in and actually embed, you know, sort of try to translate those values into code. So that, so that we, the, I guess the, the meta point here is that we want to decouple the, the values conversation from the coding conversation. You actually build the matrix by making a, as I said, a two dimensional grid where the rows are the stakeholders and their columns are their concerns. 
and we actually represent those stakeholders as much as we can at this in this conversation. And then once we have this very large thing that could be very large, we consider the cells of it and we rank the cells, basically color code them and rank them based on whether if this concern is actually happening, which we typically don't know if it is happening, um, then it, it could really break the system. It's a deal breaker for the system, if you will. So I have a couple of examples. You can see, um, you know, I mentioned Optum, that uh, that system that was was awarding help to some kinds of patients with me medical problems. Black patients were worried should be worried about accuracy. They should be worried about false negatives, i.e., they do need the help, but they're not being offered the help. And the idea is that those are the red boxes. They they sort of pop up, very easy to find. Um, and this is a, to be honest, this kind of very, very basic analysis of the risks of this al algorithm should have been uh, known to the data scientists at Optum, if not the, the business people at Optum. Um, it's kind of shocking to me how few data scientists are asked to look into how does this work? Uh, for whom does this fail? Could this fail for Black patients? Could this fail for older patients? Could blah, blah, blah. Um, so that's the idea. And this is not a complete matrix. Obviously, I, for example, didn't write older patients. And older patients are definitely a, a, a stakeholder group here. Um, and then uh, the lower example, what I like about this, uh, for this is for facial recognition, obviously black women would be concerned about accuracy, but the truth is until we know how it's being used, we don't actually know what to, else to worry about. We don't know whether false positives or false negatives are good or bad for someone um, because we don't know the context it's being used. And sort of the, one of the points I want to make about this matrix is that you actually can't fill it out if you don't have enough information. And that's that's already an answer. The answer is you, unless you can build, build this uh, ethical matrix um, and, and in a satisfactory way where the red cells are, are addressed, um, then you can't, you sort of cannot run the algorithm or you should not run the algorithm. It's kind of a litmus test in that sense. Um, okay, so I did do that. It took a few minutes, but um, I'm gonna just steal a few minutes of the Q&A because I wanna talk about explainable fairness, which is this approach um, that we're developing for the regulatory audit. Um, and the idea is um, we're gonna take we're gonna take our lessons learned from both of the other types of audits. I didn't mention very much about the about the adversarial audit, but what's what's critically important, let me just give an example from the audit um, from the adversarial audit uh, experience we've had. So student lending. The idea is, and I'll I'll do this example more in detail in a few seconds, but the idea is like we are just the data people. We're data nerds, right? We want to display what happened to students as they took loans. And we show that to the attorney general who hired us. And then the attorney general might say, hey, this doesn't look good because this outcome is much worse for black borrowers than for white borrowers. And you know, forgive me for focusing on race, but that is mostly what I work on. Um, and then and then what happens is the um the company who the student loan company will come back and say, oh, you know, it doesn't, the outcomes are different for a good reason. And here's the reason. And it's, you know, it's because we have to account for FICO score, which is a kind of credit score. Um, and then and then our job as the data scientist is to do the math. Basically, it's to say, okay, what does it mean to account for FICO score? Um, and then and look, we'll figure that out. And then we'll show another graph that it says, okay, here are the outcomes once we've accounted for that. And then the the attorney general might say, oh, this still doesn't look good. You need you have more explaining to do. My larger point is that as a data person in this context, our job is as much as possible um, just to sort of take the conversation between the, the the attorney general and the company and translate it into statistics, like in, in a very simple, straightforward way so that the conversation can go to the next step. And similarly, in explainable fairness, we're going to try to do that as well. But in, instead of the attorney general and one company, we're going to be doing it between a regulator and an entire industry of companies. Um, so we're going to be thinking about the regulator's viewpoint, where we we don't have to 
do it as comprehensively as we just explained how to do it with the ethical matrix, because typically when we're talking about a anti-discrimination law, the stakeholders are legal categories. We know who the stakeholders are. So it's much, much less, um, you know, open-ended. Like we actually know what the rows of that matrix should be. Um, we also know what the columns are supposed to be. They're supposed to be discrimination, illegal discrimination. However, we are going to sort of dig down um, pretty like pretty far in trying to determine exactly what we mean when we say that. What does it mean to be illegally discriminatory? And that is, that's the conversation we're trying to track with explainable fairness. The current situation, and I sort of alluded to this, is that, um, you know, we have um, basically lots of local governments in New York City, in D.C., in Colorado State, at the state or city level that are asking for more accountability for AI in the regulated spaces, typically lending, insurance, um, and sometimes policing with facial recognition. The companies who are vendors for this or who are you know, actually insurance companies or, or the lenders, they don't exactly know how to respond to these requests and they're doing all sorts of effort. They're making all sorts of efforts to respond. And essentially most of them are kind of lobbying efforts to make it seem like there's no problem here. Um, and, and in response, the, you know, the states and the cities are sort of saying, actually, we, we want more information. And so th that's the current situation where we're trying to respond in DC and Colorado with, uh, new rules and, um, and regulations around insurance and in New York city around hiring algorithms. Um, but the critical thing is that the rulemaking hasn't been determined. Like we don't know exactly what this will translate to, but it'll definitely be more than the industry wants. Now, the industry really doesn't want to actually have to give up their data. And from all accounts, the data actually will have to be analyzed. So the balancing, we have this idea of a balancing framework. So, and I mentioned, I alluded it to it with a student lending example, but now I'm gonna talk about it from the regulatory point of view. So the regulator might say, hey, student lenders as, as a group, we're looking at your data, and we're seeing there's differences in outcome by race, for example. It, the industry as a group can be expected to respond, oh, there's a good reason for that. Like there's a good reason we charge black people more for car, car insurance as in general. And then the regulator will say, well, what is that good reason? And the industry will be like, because blah, blah, blah. You know, we have to account for driving record or something, or we have to account for the type of car that people like that use, or we have to account for where they live and uh, the propensity for crashes in those areas. And the regulator will say, you know, basically the idea is like they have to make the case that this factor is legitimate. And that's sort of the technical way to describe it. And it's either legitimate because it's just a legitimate thing to consider, or it has a sort of it has a detriment, but it also has a benefit and the benefit outweighs the detriment. And so there has to be some kind of actual balancing um, formula for that. Um, in insurance, you know, you'll see a lot of insurers talk about how, you know, they're just following the risk, but they also have rules of, against using race or even race proxies. So, so the idea there is, you know, well, how much more risk are you inferring from this new factor that you're using? versus um, how much sort of un, you know, unintentional racism is seeping into the system. And the idea is that that's a conversation and it's not a, it's not a math question. It's actually a legal regulatory question. As the mathematician in the room, as the data people in the room, our job is to sort of, again, track that conversation and sort of say, okay, well, if, they, if they've argued successfully for, for FICO score being acceptable in car insurance, then we're going to have to work with that. We're going to have to sort of redo our formulas, taking into account FICO score. Um, FICO score is a really contentious one. I, I bring it up for that reason, um, you know, because it's not nominally related to driving, but it, there is a huge correlation between uh, low FICO scores and high risks for, for car insurance cost. Um, so that there's a huge fight in the industry about whether the whether insurance companies should be able to use FICO score. 
um, in, in particular because FICO scores also highly correlated to race. Anyway, the point is, the, the point is that overall, we think this is the way to do it, where the industry has to sort of come forward with a new sort of legitimate factor that they have to argue for each and every time. Um, and then the regulator gets to say, okay, we either accept it or we, we deny that um, as a legitimate factor. Once they accept it, we do another sort of um, loop through the, um, what is it, you know, what do the outcomes look like now uh, by race? And the, the, one of the great things about this is that it, it creates a positive feedback loop for the regulators and for regulation in general, because what it does is it'll, it gives the same test to every, every company who's, you know, presumably who's like using, who's charging for, for car insurance. Um, it allows the regulator to see, you know, for the current tests, you know, accounting for the legitimate factors that have gotten through so far, how is this, how is this industry doing overall? Each company will be doing, you know, so well, other companies were doing better. Some companies will be doing worse. So who are the stragglers? Who's doing really well? Like, what is the standard you can set? And so um, this is addressing two of the questions I mentioned at the beginning that were open. The first question is, what does it mean to be fair? And I hope it's clear that what it means to be fair is very contextual. Um, it, you know, FICO scores are highly controversial in car insurance, but they're not very controversial in lending. Um, so you can't imagine doing this once and for all for all systems. No, it has to be done extremely carefully for a given context. That's number one. And number two, because of this sort of consumer reports view on the industry as a whole, where we see who's doing well, who's doing poorly with respect to this test, who's, you know, where the average uh, company is with respect to this test. It also answers that question of what is the threshold? Because you can't, you know, we'd all love to say the threshold is perfection. The threshold is complete equity, but that's not where we expect to start. So instead we expect to start where there is inequity, but we know that, you know, the stragglers could do better. Um, and so the, the threshold can be set to be a relatively reasonable and, and yet high standard. And it could be moved over time to be, become a better standard. So that's the, that's the, thr uh, the, th the thrust of the explainable fairness. Um, I wanna give a couple of examples just to sort of um, show you it, it in, in, in action. And the first one is student lending. I already mentioned this as an example of, uh, of something that regulators could do. So the first step in, in explainable fairness is to choose an outcome of interest. So there could be a lot of different ones, but so for example, it could be like, do you get the loan offer? Yes or no? That would be, that would be a, a binary outcome. Um, what is your APR? Like that would not be binary. That, that would be, you know, um, a, a scalar. What is the, you know, what are the consequences of late payment or default? Like what are the fees charged to you if you're late? That, that's an, another kind of, um, uh, outcome you might care about. So once you've chosen an outcome, then you infer the protected class status, like you infer race and you say, okay, like, let's say it's the binary outcome of, did you get an offer? What's the rate of offers for black applicants versus white applicants versus Asian applicants versus Hispanic applicants? And if you see a big, big difference, you'll be like, hey, um, and, you know, student lenders, uh, there's a huge difference in who gets the loan. What can you what can you say about this? And that's when that 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 sort of negotiation starts. We're like, oh, that's because we we obviously don't offer um, loans to people with low FICO scores. And then they have to make the case that FICO score is a legitimate factor. And assuming that it is true, um, when we redo our we redo our um, measurements, account, accounting for FICO, and let's say we still find problems, and then the the um, industry comes back saying, oh, that's because we, we care about the type of major you have in college. And then the question, the very important question becomes, why is that acceptable as a legitimate factor? Why is that, isn't that a proxy for race? Um, or like how much more information are you getting out of, um, out of that major question, considering that it is a proxy for race? So you have to be getting a lot, you have to be sort of get, getting a lot of predictive power out of this, this particular factor for it to be legitimate considering that it is a proxy for race. So that's the idea. 
Another example would be for disability insurance, very different context. So it's going to be a different outcome of interest. So claim approval, did you get approved? That is also binary. So it's not that different. But then the, the length of the initial claim, how many weeks of, of disability insurance are you getting offered? Um, how many times you have to extend um, your disability outcome, disability claim? Um, then again, you once you've chosen the outcome of interest, you infer the racial category or whatever the protected class could be gender. Um, and then you measure the outcomes for different statuses. So you might say, okay, for women, you're, you're approving at a much higher rate than for men. And then what, can you account for that? And then the answer might be, well, of course, it, we, we automatically approve maternity claims. And that, that explains why women get approved so much more often. And if that's true, then we might account for that by, for example, taking out maternity claims from the analysis altogether and saying, okay, now removing maternity claims, we see the following differences in, in, in outcomes for men versus women, et cetera. I hope I'm giving you guys a, a general gist of the kind of thing we're talking about. I'll just finish by saying the reason we um, talk about explainable, well, the, the reason I would call this explainable fairness is because sometimes people talk about like explainability in the context of algorithms. We don't think explainability is what people want. People don't want to understand machine learning. What they want to know is why it's fair to them. So we think that this, even though it's a kind of a mess and it's a negotiation, at the end of the day, we'll, the, the, when people say, why is this fair to me? The answer will be something like, well, once we've accounted your, for your FICO score and, and your uh, maternity and whether you're on maternity leave, um, we found that this is, you know, the outcomes are 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 equitable by this measure. Um, it's it's a it's a mouthful, but actually it is uh, the closest we can imagine to what fairness will actually sound like in such um, complex systems. Um, the last slide I have is I just want to compare what I've just mentioned to my understanding of European regulation around AI, um, and I might be wrong about this stuff, so I'm willing to be corrected. Um, First of all, there's a huge amount of privacy focus in European law, which I appreciate at some level. But the problem with that is that, um, for example, in GDPR, um, it's really hard to do the, the second step of explainable fairness, um, by which I mean where you infer race in order to decide whether a system is, is treating um, people of different races um, in similar ways. Um, the GDPR basically makes it almost impossible to infer race um, in, in particular to like tag somebody's data, including their PII with a inferred race or with a any type of race, unless it is like self-reported and given with consent and all this stuff, which is never true in the kind of work I do. So there's GDPR problems straight up. <clears throat> then there's another problem which is that the inference method methodologies that we use, the inference methodology is all based on the U.S. Census. And like the U.S. Census is not perfect, but it's really, really good. Um, and in particular, we have enough racial data in the census to, um, to guess at somebody's race, knowing their first name, last name, and, and address pretty, pretty well. And I could talk about the problems that our methodology has, but the problem I'm ha we have with European uh, type versions of this is that some of the censuses don't even collect race. Like I know in France, they don't. And so it's like, uh, it's really difficult to imagine how you guys could do an analysis like this, considering that you just don't have the census data and you have these GDPR problems. Um, not to be completely negative, um, but the, the, the I, overall issue is that privacy when you guys are, you know, is as extreme on privacy issues as as Europeans are, it becomes it's like becomes an obstacle to fairness questions of fairness. And then finally, I do want to commend the AI um, for uh, for the EU for for really thinking through like this this triage point, which is like the very very first thing I realized when writing weapons of mass destruction, which is that we cannot care. We just don't have the energy, time, or uh, urgency to care about every AI or even or every um, automated decision system. 
There's just too many of them. We have to care about the ones that affect people the most. So this risk-based AI um, bill is extremely important. I really, really think that's the right way to do it. Um, I just think you guys need to um, figure your way around the privacy issues. And I'll stop there. And you could feel free to correct me on any of those issues I just brought up. Thanks, Joyce. Thanks very much, Kathy. You know, what a, a really exciting uh, kind of introduction to this ex explainable fairness. But as you say, it is very much interactive, isn't it? You have yeah. to know the context, you have to know the issue. And in many ways, uh, I think you've covered some of the issues, you know, uh, with EU law, but also, I suppose, what we've been focusing a lot on this is so-called trustworthy AI, had a lot of discussion and work on that, but haven't gone in to these other issues. And I just wonder um, how, because what you're saying makes a lot of sense. You hear people concerned about systems, whether it's medical, the cr criminal system, indeed facial recognition here. How can, it seems like a mammoth task to create a framework, which you have, that is workable within this, you know, triage or risk-based system. Yeah, well, I, I mean, one of the things that, I mean, listen, I agree, it's it's hard. Um, I I think the best metaphor I have is. Um, is if you're if you're imagining going into a into an airplane and you look in the cockpit and there's nothing there mm. and you're like whoa there's nothing there um you know the dials in the cockpit which measure wind speed and air pressure and altitude and all in how much gas you have um each of them alone isn't sufficient to make you feel safe but as a dashboard view like you're like okay like you can pretty much feel like if you have everything within thresholds of good um below max above min then we're pretty safe um the way i think of of the ai systems that are currently employed uh deployed is that there is it's like flying without a cockpit like we haven't figured out what dials to put we haven't figured out what the minimum and maximum are and the ethical matrix that that you know that big grid that I've mentioned. From my perspective, is the way to des it's a designing system for a cockpit. So the red boxes that you eventually get to are the dials. Um, to your point, though, Joyce, it's work. You know, it's work to yeah. do that. Um, but we're we need to do that. So it's like you know, if somebody complained, oh, it'd be a lot of work to design an airplane cockpit. You're just like, that's okay, that's... but let's not fly the plane until we do that, okay? Yeah. Um, so that's how I kind of feel about it. Yeah, and I, I agree with that perspective. And I suppose what I'm trying really to tease out with you, what would be the best way to create that understanding that you've presented so clearly? Uh, first of all to the public because in a lot of the cases people aren't aware even those systems are there and yeah. i just wonder you know is this a phased approach that with the public with the users with whoever um that we create what is it that we need to create awareness about these issues so well, because i think you're a very good example kathy about your son and the Nutella and the vegetables is very good. It hits it right on the spot. So what do we do? And I'll, I'll ask other questions of this, but just on this yeah. first thing, how do we get people to, besides reading your book and listening to this, how do we yeah. get people, and indeed regulators, to understand that complexity that you've, you've, you've kind of presented in a very yeah. clear manner? I would, I would argue, um, you know, when I talk about the need for triage, it's another way of saying that is if we did this process, this design process for the cockpit on a, a benign algorithm, we would not find any red boxes. Uh, we would just be like, yeah. nobody cares, nobody cares, nobody's affected, nobody cares. Um, in fact, the only person that cares about my son's dinner is my son, right? Oh. So I most do. people <laughs> and me, but the public wouldn't care, right? So that would yeah, never exactly. be important enough. So it it has to, I guess my because I'm my DNA is part journalist, like part of it has to be like, 
Well, find a stakeholder and a concern that really impresses people, like with its scariness. Um, so, you know, with Facebook, the Facebook news feed algorithm, there's many, many, many to choose from. Um, like genocide in Myanmar, the Rohingya is one of them. Or, you know, young women killing themselves because of their body dysmorphia is another one of them. Like, it's not that hard to find a stakeholder group and a concern that is that should be a deal breaker or could be a deal breaker. And, you know, and don't we want to know the answer to that? And don't we yeah. want to dial in that uh, uh, in that cockpit? So my my point is that like the triage, the triage work you're doing should be basically like find the reason we care. Yeah, find that story, that narrative of like, we don't know if this works for, you know, women as well as it works for men, but imagine it works badly for women. And this is the, this is the story that would, uh, would result or imagine it doesn't work for people in wheelchairs. Like here's what ha would happen to people in wheelchairs. They would never get a job. You know what I mean? Like you actually yeah. have to have that New York times headline in your, in your head that, that sort of says, yeah, we can't do this without checking that we can't. We can't let this airplane up in the air if we don't know if it's going to fly. Yeah, but in in a way, and I take that point. How do we get that? So, if we take one particular stakeholder group, the implications of that for the whole system is an actual fact, isn't it? Constant dialogue, interventions, clarity, um, both for ind individuals as well as groups. So a lot of the cases, you know, you've given, you know, with insurance, say with with black drivers or whatever, they're basing it, you know, as I understand on, on a simple risk analysis, it looks as if this is happening and therefore we're going to do that, where where very few of us understand that. So it means for, isn't it, transparency, clarity around the values on which we're working on when we're measuring that. Again, I... I want to decouple um, any kind of technical conversation or jargon from this issue of what yeah. seems wrong to people. Um, so yes, transparency on that on that process of figuring out what are our values, but I and transparency on like what we're trying to accomplish um, with this dial, and that's why explainable fairness is phrased in complete plain English, right? You know. Uh, I'm not saying that everyone will understand exactly what I mean by saying accounting for FICO scores, this is a fair system, but people will know what it means to account for something. That's a, that's a, that's a simple notion. Um, you know, and then people, the, the idea, I guess what I'm saying is like, when people hear that accounting for FICO scores, they can be like, wait, that's not, that's not reasonable to me. Why should you account for FICO scores? Why should someone with a better FICO score pay for less for car insurance? Like that's a reasonable pushback so and give them a give the, enough transparency so that people can air their their complaints or their agreements but not transparency at the level of code or the statistics because yeah, so it's, it's yeah it's about simple simple explainable and accessible understanding english so that we know about it we've we've got a question here kathy yeah. from david low and again keeping on the concept of explainable fairness um, can you talk a little about how the concept of explainable fairness can be applied to healthcare insu insurance at the higher level of healthcare status as distinct from race? For example, in Ireland, we had to abandon a model where health insurance was offered at the same premium, independent of age, because the system became unstable due to the free rider problem. Is there a methodology that can be used to take the emotion out of the debate? I mean, I don't think that's emotion. I think that's um, the problem between individual incentives and uh, public and group incentives. Um, so I would say the mandate for re you required to have health insurance is the only way around that. And I'm sure, I, I don't know what you guys ended up doing, um, but you know, this is, this is the question, to be clear, this is the question about insurance um, writ large. It's like, how do you pool insurance enough, sufficiently pool insurance so that it, it remains insurance, right? Because if only the people who are highly risky 
are in the pool, they're going to be paying stuff that is essentially self-insurance. Like it will be unaffordable. Yeah. And especially in the age of, of surveillance capitalism, where we have so much information about people, especially in the States, probably more information even, we can actually infer somebody's risk pool very, very minutely, which means um, if we didn't have the, if we didn't have Obamacare right now, like our, our health insurance uh, system yeah. would have totally failed. Um, it's because we are required to be in the pool and because the insurers are not allowed to charge more for pre-existing conditions. So those two things together that work, it's yeah. not It's not about emotions. It's about raw facts. facts. Yeah. And our system, I think, is completely different, really, here, a very high percentage of the population are covered by state care. I mean, all the population are covered by state care, but also, you know, very high percent, I think it's over 40% have have their own insurance as well. But perhaps, so it's quite, it's it's quite a a different system, but perhaps to go to another question, and in a way it may follow on from this, Luke Baines asked, at what stage does, should explainable fairness come into play? Should it be ex post or looking at results of algorithms in operation? Should it be something that is taken into account, you know, during the design phase from the beginning? I certainly think uh, I would prefer to fly in a plane that had a design cockpit from the beginning. But I, I guess right now we're dealing with the fact that algorithms are ruling our lives and nobody yeah. knows how they work and like if they are fair. So right now we're thinking of it as like for existing algorithms, here's how you decide whether they're behaving acceptably well. But of course, once those rules are in play, any com- any company who wants to deploy a new kind of insurance algorithm will have to first, presumably, sure. um, have the burden of showing that it complies with those rules. So uh, the, the longer term goal is to have a kind of FDA model where you're like, you have to show that before you deploy this new system, you have to show that it's safe and effective. Yeah. And in a sense, is that having a framework in which all these other algorithms actually look at in a way like your matrix? Is there a matrix there that you think could be established that could apply in most situations? No, that's the problem. The problem is the only situation where you're really reusing the same matrix over and over again is that regulatory perspective where you have a a regulator keeping an eye on many, many, many uh, players with the same type of algorithm. In general, if you have a new algorithm in a new context, you need a new ethical matrix. It's again, the ethical matrix you should think of is how you design the cockpit, how you design the cockpit. You're going to have a new cockpit for each new air type of, vehicle it's like you're not in a train anymore you're on an airplane of course you can't just translate all the knobs in the train cockpit to the airplane cockpit that's not how it works Mm -hmm. you have to you have a new set of problems so just like that for an algorithm you have a new set of problems but it's the same process where you're just like what could go wrong yeah and just coming back to you know your concept of um success Seamus Allen from the IIA has asked how can companies and regulators assess how flawed definition of success could should be fixed? How can inadvertently flawed definitions of success be distinguished from deliberate use of algorithms to produce unfair results? That's a really great question. Um, one of the answers I would have to that is uh, the ethical matrix framework sort of insists that you answer the question, what does it mean to work? Um, And what does it mean to work is already uh, really an interrogation into the definition of success that you've, that you've created. Um, You know, I think the most compelling example of a terrible definition of success is what we call in the States recidivism risk algorithms, uh, which is like sometimes called crime scores. Um, it is. It does not measure cr- criminality. It measures the probability that you are going to be rearrested oh. within two years. And so the definition of success there is actually rearrest within two years. 
Um, but but you know, no, I don't think anybody really thinks that that's necessarily a <laughs> first of all a good thing. Um, I mean, it's a complicated answer, but I guess what I'm saying is like, it's measuring the wrong thing. It's treated as if it's measuring criminality, but it's actually measuring um, who is going to be profiled by the police. Yeah. Um, you know, and so it's just actually, it's a profiling tool in itself for that reason. Um, so it's just not answering the right question. And, and, and question, yeah. The language, the language around its use is just so messed up. Um, yeah. Because people are contorting themselves to try to make it seem like it is measuring criminality. Um, and, it, and it actually boils down to like, what do we mean by a successful prison stay? We don't yeah. know what we mean by a pres for successful prison stay. Um, yeah. Anyway, it, it, this is a really hard question. But, but um, definitely it's fundamental, Kathy, isn't it? So what you're saying, you know, it, 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 who's, who's, who's defining, who's measuring? What are they measuring? And, the, uh, you know, yes. And Joyce, that's that's kind of one of the reasons it's so critical in my work to bring in those the those who are impacted directly into yes. the conversation. Yeah, um, because they need to say, I don't care what the company who owns this algorithm thinks success is. I'm going to tell you what failure looks like to me or what success looks like to me. And that that voice is critically important to making sure that the overall system is balanced. Yeah. And besides that, I suppose, and I think you're implying it, what impact it has on me as a person in a community or whatever, whether I'm a student, you know, what race or in hospital, all of that makes a lot of, de lot of sense. And from a public policy uh, viewpoint, how can the various stakeholders so you're saying they, they need to be involved, you know, and I think that's critical. How are their interests taken into account when algorithms are created and used? Can the subjects of whom algorithms make predictions be provided with rights to protect them? Or is it more the job of regulators or legislators to ensure fairness in algorithm design? It's... Yeah, I think I think it's it's kind of both. I mean, my my experience with working with the insurance commissioners is that on the one hand, there are public conversations. Um, anybody could join them and make make comments about you know what does it mean for a, a insurance algorithm in life insurance in particular to be fair. Um, but typically, members of the public don't join that call right oh. it's usually the lobbyists but there are some um particular like consumer advocates who join so that's good to have their voices there uh, but at the end of the day it is a relatively technical question and the regulator's job is to pursue the public interest and to make sure that the insurance industry is is healthy so they have to balance their their stakeholders as well um so yeah for all these reasons um, uh, that it's become it's some, somewhat obscure to the average person, um, that's even more reason that we need to make it as explainable as possible yeah. at that level of, of what does it mean that this is working fairly for me? And do, do you think that then just to finalize, unfortunately, time has caught up in this, Kathy. Do you yep. think then that the key question is that is that concept you have of fairness what it means to individual stakeholders and how that can be used and understood, perhaps understood first and used by the various, in the various designs of these algorithms. Yeah, for me, I think that's, you know, we can kind of count on people who build the algorithms to make sure they're efficient and uh, profitable. <laughs> yes. What we can't count on is that they will check that the stakeholders that care about the system overall are also being treated um, reasonably. So we we you know we need to build that that cockpit, and I fully expect it to change over time and to start out pretty minimal and insufficient. But at the end of, you know, in the next five, 10 years, I expect to see a panel on racial fairness, a panel on gender fairness, a panel for each protected class 
um, like here are the six dials we have to make sure things are working as as um, as expected and legally. Um, and I, I expect that kind of panel view to be the case for all of the uh, regulated industries, hiring, uh, insurance, credit, and housing. Um, and I don't see any other way of doing it if we're going to continue to use algorithms, which we will. Well, Katya, thank you very much for your inspiring presentation. And I thank think for this very clear view, I think the idea of a panel, the cockpit, I, you know, those of us who are nervous flying can immediately see the relevance of that. <laughs> <laughs> and perhaps I hope we won't have to wait for 10 years to bring you back to discuss that. And you could come back in person to talk to us in, in right. Dublin. Uh, and seriously, to look at those panels, to look at that, idea of, of fairness and, and that design. And, you know, as we progress in our path, which is, is quite different, I think your input will, in fact, cause people to ask questions uh, before undertaking some of these issues. I know questions are being asked now, but I think your work has made and will continue to make a great impact. So thank you very much for that. Thanks um, for having me, Grace. I'd be happy to come yeah. back. And thank you. And we will we will think about that definitely, Kathy. Okay. With a name like Kathy O'Neill, we definitely want you back. Um, <laughs> but I'd also to thank our audience for their participation, for your for your questions. And I look forward to seeing you again at our next event in early December. And also I'd like to thank our IIEA team, Mark on production. Um Hugh Murphy on communications and Seamus Allen, our digital policy researcher as well. So thank you all uh, very much. And again, thank you for, uh, for a really inspiring presentation. Kath, really enjoyed it. Thank Take you. care. Enjoy the rest of your day. Too. Bye now. Bye.